Hello and welcome to this podcast from the Irish Linen Centre and Lisburn Museum. I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Forbes, the penultimate speaker in our Winter Talks programme. He has been a secondary school teacher for over 30 years and has worked extensively on the life of Robert Blair Paddy Meehan, a founder of the Special Air Service or SAS. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Many thanks, sir. Thank you. So just to start off, Peter, who was Robert Blair Paddy Meehan and why was he important? Um, Blair was a... Um, Apart from being a, a right royal character on the uh, on the rugby scene um, and around Newton Ards, uh, played a very important part in um, during the war with the formation of the Special Air Service. Um, he later went on to lead them, and um, right through to the end of the war, and and bring them back to to um, completion really, because the the army the army had tried to fragment them as much as possible. Um, so Blair was the person who who took the helm and sort of tried to bring them all back and uh, made it from a force of about initially sixty odd men um, up to oh you're talking the thousands you know um, uh, his name uh, lives long in the the history of the SAS because he had such a pivotal um, role in making sure that the, the continuation of this fine and fantastic service. So. That's really interesting. M- Main himself is a figure of considerable public interest. And for example, in 2022, he was one of the principal characters portrayed in the historical drama SAS Rogue Heroes. So we'll maybe not get into whether it's a, an accurate representation of Main, but I just wanted to know when and how did your personal interest in Main begin? Um. It all started quite a long time ago. Um, I had, uh, I'm had i a teacher by profession, a maths teacher, not a history teacher, a maths teacher. And, um, and I was covering a, a PE class, as you do, uh, and the PE boys wanted to be out playing football. And they were stuck in a maths classroom. So I thought I would try and entertain them a wee bit, and uh, I put up photographs of old Newton Ards, um, to see if they recognised the places. One of the pictures showed uh, a little um, Morris Minor, white Morris Minor car, sitting in the square in Conway Square, Newton Arts, and I asked the boys, what's sitting in the square now? And they said, oh, that's easy. It's a statue. And I said, brilliant. Statue of who? And they said, oh, dead easy. Blair Main. And I said, magic. Who's Blair Main? And there was deathly silence. None of them knew. They knew the name. They knew the, the statue, but they didn't know his story. So I endeavoured to inform them. And over the next few weeks, when I covered them yet again, <laughs> as you do with a PE class, um, I, I told them the story about Blair Main. And uh, uh, one of the wee lads at the back of the class, a um, chap called Chris Hull, put his hand up and said, um, my great-grandfather used to drive for Blair Main. And I did my usual and said, yes, Chris, you and everybody else's great-grandfather. Um, but on my, my drive home, I lived in Duke at the time, so it was quite a long drive from Newton Arts. It stood over in my head and I said, uh, I had a wee look at uh, all the books that I had about Blair. And there was a fella called Billy Hull. So I went back into school the next day and I said to young Chris, what was your great-grandfather's name? And he said, Billy. And I said... Chris, I owe you an apology. Your great grandfather drove for Blair Main. So that got me researching about Billy initially, um, and then about Blair. And it got me looking at for the um a copy of the SAS War Diary, which we now have. We 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 raised the money and purchased a copy and gave it to the people of Newton Ards that now lives in the library, and anybody can go and see it. Um and yeah, it kind of just, most people would say it went downhill after that, but it went uphill because the family contacted me, Billy Hull's family contacted me, people who I should not know contacted me because um, I'm just a wee lad from Temple Patrick. And um, yeah, it's just been amazing. Uh, it's a fantastic story how you got from the classroom to... To, to yeah. where we are now. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh-huh. Um, 
So in Lisbon and Castle Ray, we actually have a, a connection to the early years of the SAS. Private Joseph Walker of Moira mm-hmm. belonged to the regiment. In July 1944, he parachuted in behind enemy lines south of Paris, mm-hmm. but was captured and eventually murdered by the Gestapo on mm-hmm. the 9th of August. He was just 21 years old. Can you tell us a bit about the kind of operations the SAS and men in particular were involved in during the Second World War? What set the SAS apart from other regiments? Certainly, indeed. Um, the, the SAS were, were in, in German-occupied France well before D-Day. They were operating continuously, um, causing mayhem to the Germans by blowing up railway lines and uh, etc. Um, so they were they were constantly there. Um, they they went into places that that no no one else really went to. There was a lot of um, representation from folk from Northern Ireland and and Southern Ireland as well. And Blair was um, universally proud of all of them. He um, he made sure that if he he heard a, an Irish accent, be it north or south, he went over and spoke to them. Um, that's how he met Billy Hull, who he ended up being his driver. He, he heard the accent and said, "You're my driver." Um, so uh, the 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 SAS were an incredible organisation because they had so many different strands of people from England, Wales, Scotland. Northern Ireland and Ireland, but but Blair really focused on on the Irish guys. So he would have known him, and he would have spoken to him, and he would probably be the person who wrote the letter to the family, um, uh, saying about um, the the passing of the young fella, um, and he would have taken that very very heavily himself. So um, yeah, they were an organisation who worked behind enemy lines, um, and. As a result, as a small organization, they paid heavily for um, for what they were doing when they were if if they were captured by the Gestapo, especially there was the uh, the Hitler had um, produced the commando order as it was called. So anybody who was special forces, basically, if you were captured, you were handed over to the Gestapo. You were then tortured and executed. So yeah, it's it's sad, um, but. It, it's it's nice that that man is being still remembered to this day by the people of, of his hometown. Fantastic. And why is Maine a good fit for the SAS? And wh- why does he join, or how does he join? Uh, and what's his overall contribution then by the end of the war? Um, he, he joined initially. He was 11th Scottish Commando, wasn't getting to see an awful lot of action, had been deemed by... Um, while he was in the uh, Queen's University Officer Training Corps as being um, not officer material. Um, uh, But anyway, he um, had been in 11 Scottish Commando. The commandos were starting to to basically close up and finish off, uh, and and Blair was looking for elsewhere to go. Um, At one point, he was going to head over to the Far East um, to, to see action there, but thankfully... There was a friend of his, um, Ian McGonagall, who was a very good friend from years back. Uh, he was Blair and the, and the McGonagall family were very, very friendly. Um, and uh, young McGonagall had heard about the, the this um, fledgling group called the SAS, set up by David Sterling, and basically convinced Blair you should maybe think about this. And then he also convinced David Sterling you should maybe talk to this man. Um, and that's where initially the, the, the connection was. Um, it was the perfect thing for Blair because they weren't they weren't a terribly rigid um, kind of army um, discipline type organization. Um, they, they, they ran with um, a transformational suggestion basically a transformational command and that was where you don't tell people what to do. you basically say to them, you know, come on, we'll do it, go and do this. And, and should, should we think about this? You involve them. Um, and that worked perfectly for Blair because he wasn't the sort who would give orders. He was the man who, who talked you into, oh, come on, we'll go and give it a shot. You know, um, 
And I know when he joined up initially uh, into the Royal Artillery, he joined up with a friend of his, um, uh, a guy called Ted Griffith. And uh, and basically they, they said, Come, why don't we give this war thing a go? You know, it wasn't a case of we have to do this. We'll give it a shot, you know. And that's how, how Blair dealt with his men. Um, his men knew not to push it because he was a strict man when he had to be. But at the same time, he he was very decent and um, would give his men, you know, a fighting chance. And uh, for for example, this um, if if there were if somebody stepped out of line, for instance, um, they had the choice. They could RTU to return to unit. Um, in other words, they're being kicked out, or they could take. Um, a set of boxing gloves and go into the boxing ring with, with Blair and see how long they would last. He gave them one last chance that if they could make him laugh, he would um, he would probably forgive them. And there's a great story of one chap who uh, who arrived back to camp late and uh, um, he was being questioned. He was you know, putting his gloves on at the time and Blair said, well, if you can make me laugh, you know, we'll, we'll see. So the young fella said, well, it was dark and I, I went to light a cigarette and the wind was blowing. So I turned my back to the wind, lit my cigarette and then I walked off 180 degrees in the wrong direction. And that's why I was late back to camp. Well, that, um, that tickled Blair entirely and the young fella got let off. So that's the sort of, of leader he was. He was perfect for this group of, of bearded brigands, really. Um, uh, so, yeah, he fitted in perfectly. Great. And just a final question, Peter, very briefly. If you could go back in time and meet me in Israel, you'd want to ask him? That's a hard one. Um, no, I, I, I would just... Because I, he, he didn't suffer fools gladly, I think. Um, and I'm I'm a, a damn fool, really. Uh, um I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be even worthy of talking to the man. Um, I would just like to see him in in operation, you know, and 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 uh, with his men. I would just love to see that, but certainly no, I do. I'm not worthy to talk to the man at all. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to play a bit of rugby with him or something. <laughs> I I think that would be a big yeah. mistake. Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. He was um, a very strong man. He was known to at times pick scrum halves up and walk off the pitch with them you know um yeah yeah he um he he never started a fight on a pitch but he ended every single one that he was involved in (laughs) he was a phenomenally strong man and um yeah uh, you just have to take your hat off to to that kind of strength and the fact that it was so controlled when it needed to be your time peter looking forward to your talk thank you sir Thank you.